Well, that was a fascinating webinar, and I've been waiting to talk with Daniel Goleman for an awfully long time. Um, so I'm very interested to hear what my two colleagues uh, thought of it. We're going to start the talkback session now, as we will at the end of every webinar. Um, and so we'll be joined by Dr. Kelly McGonigal, who is a lecturer at Stanford University's Center for Compassion and Altruism Research and Education, and she's the author of the willpower instinct. And I'm also joined by Ron Siegel, Dr. Ron Siegel. He's a licensed psychologist. He's assistant clinical professor of psychology at Harvard Medical School, as well as in private practice. And he is the author and co-author of many volumes. Um, he is the co-author, for instance, of Mindfulness and Psychotherapy, which is the, t the seminal work um, for any of the, mic, the many, many psychotherapists who are on the call. So um, as we're going to do each time, let's jump in by first getting your thoughts on what stood out to you. And this time we'll, talk, we'll start with you, Kelly. Great. I think the thing that really stands out to me is Dan recognizing that attention is a resource that underlies many of the things we care about, whether it's emotion regulation or being successful at work, um, being able to sustain our relationships to empathy and compassion, and to recognize that not only is it a resource, but that it is a trainable skill and that it's a resource that can be depleted by our environment. And I think these are all really useful ways to think about how we can choose to engage with attention and train attention and also kind of protect and nurture attention as a resource that's going to make it um, possible for us to, to do the things that matter most. Yeah, I've been thinking much more about the style with which people um, use their attention. Yeah. Um, and uh, thinking of that uh, almost diagnostically a bit, um, not diagnostically in, path in a pathological way, but just thinking of it um, as a frame of reference to. And one, of, one of the things that Dan mentioned that didn't actually end up getting teased up too much, but I think is really important is that when we talk about attention, sometimes we think of it as if it's sort of an on or off switch. Are you paying attention? You know, thinking about focused concentration as being the only form of attention. Um, but he mentioned that there's actually a lot of different qualities to attention, and each one of them is trainable. Mm -hmm. You need the ability to focus, but we also need the ability to be open to what's happening around us. We need a kind of open awareness that is a, a broad attention that mm -hmm. allows us to access new information um, and to really get to know these different qualities of attention. Mm -hmm. Ron, how about you? What stood out to you? Well, those are the comments that Kelly just made definitely resonate with with me as well. You know, it actually reminds me, uh, I, I don't do it now, but I spent many years doing psychological testing. And uh, there, when we were looking at cognitive uh, capacities, we always used to think of them as uh, as like a chain. And a chain functions well, but it's only as good as its weakest link. And there are so many areas in which we have difficulty where it looks like there's either an emotional problem or it looks like there's a, uh, a deficit in some kind of intelligence and what the weak link so often is is untrained attention not knowing how to focus one's attention in a way that's appropriate to the task at hand so I found it very useful uh, to hear Dan Goleman uh, go into attention in this kind of detail. I was also very moved by his discussion of, uh, in essence, the power of delayed gratification. You know, this is what, uh, I think it's in Kelly's shop there, uh, Walter Michel's uh, <clears throat> experiments uh, were first done at Stanford years ago with the marshmallow showing the kids who can manage to wait for the second marshmallow uh, do so much better in other life measures. And now this recent study out of New Zealand uh, showing again the same thing, that it's this capacity to not have to go with the impulse of the moment, but to be able to exercise some restraint and be with desire and not act on it seems to be so important for so many different uh, forms of, uh, of successful functioning in life. And, and finally, I really appreciated his 
emphasis on what gets in the way of attention because he was basically saying, you know, a, a big thing that gets in the way of attention is the remarkable power of painful emotions. Mm. And that's certainly my experience. And, you know, many of the listeners are clinicians I know on the call and in our clinical work, whether in the mental health side or on the physical medicine side, it's so often the painful aspect of what we're listening to, of what we're working with, that makes it hard to be with it and makes us separate or leave the room uh, in some way. And I, I'm, I hope we'll have uh, time to discuss mm. that a little bit more going mm. forward. So, Ron, staying with you for a moment, um, we talked about emotional distractions as the main reason for wavering atten uh, attention or wavering concentration. What are some ways to mediate that type of distraction? Yeah, that, that's great because that's that is that point that leapt out um, to me. You know, again, going back to the psychological testing experience, interestingly, one of the ways people use cognitive testing is to evaluate what's going on emotionally, to basically see where are the areas that we get interrupted in our attention. Uh, you know, Jung's old word association test, you know, where they say, well, you know, if I say cat, what comes to your mind? They weren't so interested in what came to people's mind. They were interested in the latencies, to what extent people got hung up on a word and had trouble thinking of something else, because that would indicate an area of emotional conflict or emotional juice. And those are indeed the things that, that make for trouble around attention. So there's a lot of ways that we can work with that. Uh, one of them that uh, Dan alluded to is, uh, is the use of mindfulness meditation. And he was emphasizing the training the muscle of concentration part, that by repeatedly returning the attention to an object of awareness, we get better at returning our attention to the object of awareness. But it works in another way too, which I think is really interesting. By sitting with and feeling or being with everything that comes up, including fear, including anger, including sadness, including the full range of uh, physical discomforts and emotional discomforts, we get better at allowing those things to be. We feel less compelled to distract ourselves from those. And it's really this capacity to be able to be with pain, emotional and physical pain, that allows us to stay on task without having to have our attention hijacked every time something uh, painful comes up. And meditation practice can do that, mindfulness practice can do that. A lot of traditional forms of psychotherapy can help us with that, simply talking about the issues that are painful to us and other auxiliary things like journaling, um, anything that helps us to get in touch with and be with emotion can actually enhance our attention mm. by diminishing the distractions. So Kelly, um, Daniel also identified concentration and empathy together as forms of attention that we should be focusing on improving. Do you agree? Yeah, I really appreciate that he brought up the role of attention in a process like empathy. Um, Sylvia Morelli at Stanford recently published a paper showing that uh, if you give someone something to focus on, uh, a little distraction, a little mental task, it actually reduces their ability to notice, understand, and then respond empathically to other people's emotions, both good emotions and negative emotions. Um, and other work has shown that, that when people's minds are wandering, they, uh, the brain responds less with that instinctive uh, empathy to other people's pain. So we know that the placement of your attention has a lot to do with whether or not you are able to respond empathically to others. And it really isn't so much about cultivating um, sort of internal focus or tight control of your attention, but about being able to be in a state of shared attention. Um, at the Center for Compassion, where we train compassion and empathy, we really talk about this kind of expanded attention that allows you to tune into and notice what is present for someone else, while at the same time staying connected to what is present in you, noticing perhaps your own distress that arises when you are aware of someone else's emotions, um, noticing your own sort of agenda or stories that might be triggered by another person's emotions, and having the attentional flexibility not to get sucked into that, but to be able to keep one's attention placed on the person that you are interacting with. And the way that Ron described uh, mindfulness towards one's own emotions, that is an attentional skill that really supports our ability to be empathic and to be compassionate. So I think that a lot of these skills go together nicely. Mm, mm. So Ron, back to you. Um, the ability to cultivate concentration depends a lot on our motivation. 
um, how can we motivate ourselves and, and people to concentrate more? I, I had a really interesting experience that taught me something about this many years ago. It was about 30 years ago, and I was riding on a bus, and the bus must have been about a five-hour bus ride uh, through rural Peru going to see the Nazca Lines. And uh, there were a bunch of different people from different countries there. And there was one fellow with his six-year-old daughter. And I had been working in community mental health some, for some years. And when I saw the six-year-old girl, I was amazed. She spent the entire bus ride doodling, looking out the window, doing simple things, fully engaged in her activities, no complaints, no difficulties. And I asked him, I said, this is not what I'm used to seeing in children. You know, what's the secret? And he said, oh, well, she's never seen television. <laughs> she's, you know, she's, we're, I've lived as an expatriate and she's simply never seen it. So she focuses on small things and small things are big for her. And I thought of that in contrast to say what happens with Sesame Street where what we do is trying to compete with commercial TV, the people at PBS have created a system of rapid stimulation, constantly changing scenes. No scene lasts for more than a few seconds so as to try to engage attention, turning up the amplitude, if you will, on the stimulus rather than turning up the amplitude on the attention. But that takes motivation. Um, Russell Barkley, who's done a lot of studies of ADHD, says it's not a disorder of attention, it's a disorder of motivation. Hmm. Kids with ADHD can play video games all day long. And there was a wonderful study done at McLean Hospital near me where they took kids with ADD and kids without ADD. They put them in a room and they had them do an academic task. And they deliberately created a commotion, a drama going out in the hallway. Afterwards, they quizzed the kids both on the academic task and the commotion. The ADD kids didn't do so well on the academic task, but they could outline exactly what was happening in the hall, the full drama in complete detail. The other kids did better on the academics, but didn't know what was going out on the hall, going on in the hallway. So it's so clear that it's not about difficulty paying attention. It's about what draws our attention and whether we have difficulty paying attention to something which isn't intrinsically rewarding, which leads to the answer best I know it. And this is what educators have been struggling with for years. How do you make stuff intrinsically rewarding? And one way to do it is to chunk it into small enough chunks so that we feel rewarded by it. In other words, instead of sitting down going, oh my gosh, I've got to write a chapter, let me write a couple of pages and congratulate myself on writing a couple of pages, have a little reward built in there. The other, though, which I think is even more important, is noticing that we don't have to turn up the amplitude on the stimulus in order to get engaged. All we have to do is notice that the task is one of engagement. So deliberately trying to appreciate the little things, in other words, smelling the roses, being present to experience, I think can go a long way toward motivating us to pay attention. Thanks. That was interesting. Um can I actually add something to that? Yes. It's really, you know, one of the things that um, has most fascinated me about the science of attention is the research showing that anything that you pay attention to becomes inherently rewarding. That the quality of your attention determines the quality of your experience. And so oftentimes, you know, it's how do you motivate people to pay attention? I mean, it, it may be hard to motivate them, but when you actually have the experience of paying attention to something, you almost can't help but fall in love with it or find it interesting. I mean, it's why artists fall in love with their models and their muses. Anything you give that quality of, of intense mm. attention to. And so in some ways, when there's something that you're avoiding because you think it's going to be boring or uninteresting, you know, the solution is give yourself one minute, five minutes at it, and many things become intrinsically interesting when you choose to bring that quality of attention to them. Mm, thanks. That's that's an, an interesting addition there, um, Kelly. For let's talk a little bit about people who are right brain oriented. Um, what are some ways to help balance left and right brain activity? Well, I wanted to start by giving um, a little bit of a different frame on this idea of right and left brain um, orientation. Uh, Dan had talked about it in terms of negative and positive emotions, which is a part of the picture. But um, probably the best way to think about individual differences in right versus left prefrontal activation 
is to use the framework of approach versus avoidance rather than positive and negative emotions. That what really seems this individual difference seems to be about whether or not people are oriented towards going after what they want. That's the approach. This is something that's meaningful. I'm going to go after it. I'm willing to take action. I want to move towards or lean into life versus people whose primary orientation is one of withdrawal. I want to avoid the things that I don't want to feel. I want to protect myself and more of a tendency to escape, to look for ways to kind of to move back rather than lean in. And um, much research has shown that people who have a strong tendency towards that avoidance orientation are more likely to be depressed or anxious. It's not so much because they're having negative emotions, but because the consequence of relating to life in that way um, really increases stress and decreases personal resources. And I think from that framework, you can start to understand what some of the strategies are that people use to help people shift to a more approach-oriented orientation, which has the side effect of increasing happiness, not because you are happy, but because the things you do when you choose to approach rather than avoid create the experiences and the attitudes that foster genuine happiness. Um, so some of the things that you can do are, are basically to encourage people to, to rethink their relationship to their, their own goals and their own actions, to be aware of where there might be a tendency to retreat or avoid, and see if you can reshift an avoidance goal into an approach goal. So rather than thinking, I don't want to let people down, to think this is an opportunity to demonstrate my strengths and share with others. You know, rather than thinking about how uncomfortable a certain activity is going to be and wanting to avoid that discomfort, uh, thinking about the meaning that it has for you in life and to try to really imagine the action that you could take that would increase meaning or build a relationship. And to really get people to focus on actions that are consistent with their values and their goals uh, is the best way to increase an approach orientation that has the consequence of really shifting people's emotional balance and emotional states. But I think it's actually often more important to start with actually leading people toward action and commitment rather than trying to get the emotions right mm. first. Mm. Thanks. Um, we have to wrap up tonight. Um, uh, this has been fascinating, the, our whole em emphasis on, on focus and attention. Um, next week, we're going to shift our focus and we're going to be talking about epigenetics. Epigenetics is uh, about gene expression, and um, and we'll be talking about the the brain and how that's related to epigenetics. We'll talk about um, how our genes turn on and off, and and three ways that stress can affect us even before we're born, mm -hmm. and how fear and negativity can play a role in our genetics. Um, so wherever you are tonight, and people are uh, watching from all over the world, uh, thousands of you from all over the world. Wherever you are, thanks for being here. Um, we're looking forward to seeing you next week. And I want to make a special thank you to people who have signed up for a gold membership. You helped make this possible because you helped us be able to maintain our position of making these free to people. Um, many people can't live in countries that um, the earnings just aren't sufficient to support this. So thank you if you've signed up for a gold subscription. It really helps to support, to underwrite um, all of, of the expense involved. And thank you for doing that. In addition to all of the links that you're getting um, for the, uh, the downloads, for the videos and the audios and the transcripts and the bonus calls and so forth, you're also, I hope, um, getting the satisfaction of knowing that you're helping um, to make this available to people throughout the world. So good night everyone. I'm excited to see you next week when we'll be talking about with Bruce Lipton about epigenetics. <laughs>